Open with me, if you would, to the book of John. It is a blessing to be back in the United States of America. We love India. We miss India. We love the people there. We love the lost people there that we're able to preach to, but even in a special way, the Christians there. I have a good friend there who is the principal of the school. It's remarkable. Sometimes you can travel halfway around the world and find someone that's more similar to you than most of your friends where you live. Uh, we're the, almost the exact same age. We got married the same year. We have the same number of children. They're, our children are almost the exact same age. He speaks three languages. It's a blessing to be back and to be able to open up God's Word and, and to consider the truth from His Word this morning, which is what we will do. <clears throat> As we begin, I want to draw our minds first to the book of John and introduce our subject, and then I want to give you a picture. That is the picture that I saw with my own eyes in India, a problem that set before us that we had to solve that led to this sermon. The book of John opens with the account of the creation of the world. It opens very similarly to Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning. In the beginning. Those same words opens the book of John. And, and, and in the beginning, we learn that there was one called the Word, and he was with God, and he was God. We learn that he made all things. goes on to tell us in verse 14 that that Word became flesh. And then if you continue down in the chapter, you'll see that who that word certainly is. We, we know from 14 it must be Jesus, but say you didn't know Jesus. You see, when I sit down in the home of a Hindu person, as I did several times during this trip, I sit down in the home of this Hindu man, for instance, there in Mirza. He doesn't know anything about Jesus. He's heard the name a couple of times, but that's it. So he doesn't know from the context clues that the word becoming flesh equals someone named Jesus Christ. But if you go down later in the chapter, what do we see? We see that the one who was flesh, or the, this word was to, to bring about the remission of sins. And you go down in the chapter and you see John the Baptist and he sees Jesus coming and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so in chapter 1 of John, we find out that Jesus Christ is the word that was from the very beginning, was with God, is God. And we find out that that word created us. He is the one who had the active role of creation. And that he is the one who left his estate on high, put on flesh, dwelt among us, to bring about the taking away of our sins. And then you can go into chapter 2 and see... The, um, the beginning of the miracles of that Jesus at Cana of Galilee. And in chapter 2, not only does Jesus perform his first miracle, but he describes the last and great miracle of his life in verse 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up which you'll find if you go down to chapter 19 and begin reading there. Many miracles recorded in the book of John. The greatest of all of those, the fact that Jesus, for Jesus, and no other man ever, the gates of death swing both ways. He had the power over the gates of death. Others were resurrected. Say Lazarus. Yes, Lazarus was resurrected, but how? He was called by Jesus out of that tomb. No one called Jesus out of his tomb. He said, I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. That's the Jesus that we're talking about this morning. In chapter 3, he meets with a man named Nicodemus. And he explains to him this thing called the new birth. And he explains to him that no man shall enter into the kingdom of God except he is born again of water and of the Spirit. And then, of course, in verse 16 of that chapter, we have what is the most famous verse in all of the Bible, the most widely known verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have 
everlasting life. This brings us in the direction toward. This brings us up to the doorstep of John chapter 4. This Jesus, God, our Creator, our Redeemer, the one who has put on flesh, the one who spoke those famous words to Nicodemus, the one who performed miracles. We find him in John chapter 4 doing something very strange to the people of his time. He makes a decision to travel through Samaria. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say he needed to go through Samaria. And here in Samaria, in Sychar, he comes across a woman at a well. And that's our subject this morning. The water that is the living water that is in me. You know, my, one of my heroes in the faith is a young man who's about 21 years old. I spoke of him Wednesday night. His name is Barnabas. It's amazing to see the strength of his faith at such a young age. He has endured more for the cross than anyone I know. And he's 21 years old. But he faces things that, that you and I never fathom facing for our faith on a daily basis. He faces the possibility of being killed for his faith. He faces constant pain, suffering for his faith. Day by day, sores all over his body, sickness inside of his body, because he wants to stay where he is and preach the gospel to the lost. We went to Kokrajar to meet with him. And again, like last time, I did not want to go to Kokrajar. But the week before we went, we were in the book of Luke again. And uh, we were discussing the type of love that Jesus has. And, and we were discussing the commandment uh, that, that's actually found th throughout the scriptures, but also in 1 John, where Jesus says, and we're taught to love the way that Jesus loved us. And the class and I, we said, well, how can we determine this? And so we diagrammed it out and we said, what kind of love does Jesus have? How will we love each other the way that Jesus loves us? And the answer is very clearly, it's sacrificial love. You see that in Ephesians chapter 5 when he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How did Jesus love the church? Sacrificially. How should husbands love their wives? Sacrificially. How does Jesus, how did he love us, those who are in this room this morning? Sacrificially. How shall we love each other? Sacrificially. So you can understand that when Thursday at 1130 rolled around and it was time to leave to go to Krokarjar, I don't want to go to Krokarjar. It's not comfortable. It's not safe. It's, it's, it's a terrible ride in the car. But there was Barnabas out there in Kokrajar, and he doesn't face those difficulties one weekend out of a year. He faces them every single day. So we go out to Kokrajar. Here's Barnabas' great problem. He's sick from the water. The water is literally making these, these sores all over his skin. Every time he, he cooks with it, he drinks it, it's making him sick. So, well, Barnabas, the water didn't used to make you sick. What happened? Well, brother, there's two wells. He takes us out and he shows us. I remember two wells. There's a well over on the left. Edison remembers this. And there's a well on the right. And when Edison went with me last year, one of the first things that Barnabas told us was, don't get water out of the well on the right. It will make you sick. Only get your water from the well on the left. There was a brother there who is a great evangelist named Lalite. He was teaching the people that Barnabas lived with. They're, they're, they're not New Testament Christians. He was teaching them that the church they're a part of is like the well on the right. In other words, it's water, yes, but it's not the truth. It's not pure. It has iron in it. It has all kinds of contaminants in it. Drink, but, but, but the doctrine of Christ is like the well on the left. It's clean. It's pure. When they heard the analogy, they stopped using the well on the left. 
They didn't like the teaching. They stopped using it. Whether intentionally or not, it broke. My theory is someone broke it on purpose because they didn't like his analogy. Barnabas is sick. This is a school for little children. The little children are drinking this poisonous water and are sick because the well on the left is broken and it would cost $23 to fix it. Their problem was the source of their water. They were pulling forth this contaminated water and it was making them sick. You give those children that throughout their childhood and it will literally kill them. They will die at a younger age from drinking that horribly rancid water. I said, Barnabas, would they let you fix it if we gave you the money? He said, yeah, they'd let me fix it. They'd be very happy, I, I suppose. And so what we did was we went out and, and we gave him a sermon. And he took the head man after we were gone and he preached that sermon to him. And, and the sermon was, and the gist of it was, my brothers came and they know I'm sick. And you know why I'm sick? Because I'm drinking contaminated water. And so are you. But they have left this money to fix that well. Because they know that I need pure water so that I can stay here and preach the pure doctrine of Jesus Christ. And just like we need pure water to be healthy, we need pure teaching to be spiritually healthy. And the message was, Barnabas, every time they come out and take water from the well on the left, they, need, they will remember that sermon in their heads. I've got to have the right source of water. And that is exactly the point made by Jesus to this woman at the well when he meets her. The first thing Jesus says to her in verse 7, Jesus says, a woman of Samaria came to the to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. He starts the conversation. She never would. Here she is, number one, a woman, and number two, a Samaritan, and here's a Jewish man. So he starts it. He initiates, give me a drink. And hear what the woman says to him. We're going to notice that, that she asks three questions, and we're just going to notice where the misunderstanding comes from and what that can mean to us. Question number one comes from verse 9. We learn that Jesus asked her this. His disciples are not there. They've gone away to, 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 to the city to buy food, verse 8. Verse 9, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? It explains there at the end of the passage, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. What she does not yet comprehend, and what we must comprehend, is that no one, nobody in the world, is categorically exempt from drinking the water that Jesus provides. You can never, ever, ever categorically exempt someone. I'm white, I'm black, I'm Hispanic, I'm rich, I'm poor. Go into the current uh, mood of our nation today. Someone says, I'm in the homosexual movement. You're not categorically exempt from drinking the water Jesus has. You need that water. I'm in the transgender movement, so therefore don't talk to me about Jesus or don't give me that message. No, no, you're not categorically exempt. You need it too. Some people exempt themselves by the choices they make, but no one is categorically exempt. Now, this is a very important message when you're in India and you're talking to, to Barnabas and these people there and you're going into their homes and you're studying with them because you understand these people are broken up by tribe and they kill each other by tribe. I found out this time in the home of a man, and I'll show you his picture in the second hour, um, he faces the threats of death every day because he obeyed the gospel. His family is the only family in the entire village that's obeyed the gospel. And the denominational leaders, he left a denomination in that village. Most of the denominational pastors are members of the underground terrorist movements. So that when you leave that group, number one, you anger them. And number two, they've told him many times, they come and tell him, hey, who's going to protect you? Your, your Church of Christ friends aren't protecting you. There's not enough of them here. Who's going to protect you? 
When they come and burn your house, who's going to protect you? He has to turn right around and say, no matter the way you're behaving yourself right now, you terrorists that live in the jungles and come out and murder children and women, you're not categorically exempt. You borrow underground, you need to drink this water. You out of Asi underground, you need to drink this water. You can't live on one street in Memphis and live your life as if people a couple of blocks down from you are exempt from needing this water. You can't be from one socioeconomic background in Memphis and say, well, I will simply give water to other people of my socioeconomic background. People that talk the way I talk. People that drive the kind of cars that I drive. Live in the type of house I live in. She didn't understand this. The way she saw life was there are Samaritans and there are Jews. How often do I allow myself to see life that way in my culture? Not Samaritan and Jew, but you and me. You guys over there and us over here. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The answer is the answer that she needed to hear. The answer is the answer that we need to hear. The words of Jesus Christ are clear. Does he bring up race? No. Does he bring up the differences between their people? All that historical background that separates them, that they were the leftovers from the carryings away, that they intermarried, that they did all these wicked things, that they made a new place of worship and worshipped abominations? Does he bring all this up? Does he say, you know, well, your people were wicked and you did all these, and we're pure. Does he bring any of that up? No. He's a pure son of the line of Judah. But he doesn't bring that up. What does he focus on? He focuses on the message. It doesn't matter that I'm a Jew and that you're a Samaritan. If you would have known who I was, if you understood who I am, you just asked me to give you this water that, that you can drink. It's living. It's living water. The woman's going to ask her second question. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? There's a lot to this question. But if you want to boil it down, what it comes down to is she has a misunderstanding and it's a misunderstanding that is throughout the religious world today. And that is this. No one compares to Jesus. You don't even begin to compare someone to Jesus. No one compares to the source that is Jesus Christ. No source of anything compares to the source of Jesus Christ. She is talking about a physical well and physical water. In no way can that possibly ever compare to the greatness of Jesus. She's trying to begin a comparison that is foolish. Jesus shows that in his answer kindly, but he shows it in his answer. Now, I want you to think about what Jesus says, because upon my first reading of this, it didn't occur to me. But listen to the answer Jesus gives. Jesus answered and said to her, verse 13, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him, that I shall give him, will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The realization of the answer of Jesus that did not hit me at first is this. Jesus is also making the comparison. But he doesn't even mention Jacob's name. He simply says, yeah, this water. What water is he talking about? Jacob's water. Yeah, you've got Jacob's water. Okay. You've compared me to Jacob. Am I greater than Jacob? Well, let's just say this. If you drink this, you'll be thirsty again. But the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. You know, you could drink from Jacob's well and die of thirst later in your life. If you drink from the water Jesus gives, you will never lack the opportunity to have all the water you ever need. That is, 
let's talk about that for just a moment. He says you'll never thirst. Does this mean you'll never have the need or the desire for the water that he gives again? Of course not. That's foolishness. We know that's not true. How do we know that's not true? Even the Beatitudes say what? Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What do the scriptures teach? That you should desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. There is a thirsting, there is a hungering for God's word, for this, for this living water that, that, that is inside of us and that must be in us. So then what does Jesus say? What does he mean when he says you will never thirst? Perhaps the easiest way to see this is to draw a stark contrast of a picture. One of the phrases Jesus spoke upon the cross was this word, these words, I thirst. Jesus Christ thirsted on the cross for physical water. Why? Because his body had been through such a horrendous experience of being beaten and crucified. And as he hung there upon the cross, he said, I thirst. And I've heard it said before that the worst pain on the battlefield, those men who lie dying, the worst pain on the battlefield is not the wound that they've received, it is the thirst. The greatest cry of the dying on the battlefield is not morphine, it's water. Give me water. Why? Because they thirst. Jesus on the cross thirsted. What does it mean he thirsted? He lacked that which he needed, and there was no ready source for it to be given to him. When you drink of the water that Jesus gives... You will never thirst like that. Does it mean you'll never desire the living water? Of course not. But the idea is this. Listen to what he says that follows. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Meaning what? You'll continue to desire it, but it will abound in you so much so that you will never be lacking for it again. You will never, Christian, be able to stand and say, I'm in thirst, I'm in need, and it's not met, I, 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 it's not satiated. That will never happen. This, this, this woman at the well does not yet understand this. She does not grasp the concept because she is thinking about this, this man-made source of water. But do you know what is sad in our time? What is tragic in our time? is we make this mistake over and over again. Nobody here, nobody here goes out. Our wells today would just be our faucet in our homes. We live in a very strange place where we don't drop buckets into the earth. We just twist something and water comes out. But nobody here would go to their faucet in their home and say, you know, this, is, this may be as good as Jesus. You wouldn't do that. However, spiritually, we make the same mistake this woman at the well makes. Spiritually, we go to wells where we ought not to be. We seek drink from a well that is not the water that Jesus provides. Any man that's ever dug a spiritual well since the time of Christ has dug it in vain. One of the things that we speak to those people in India when we speak with them is this. And, and, and we got an invitation to go to Manipur because of these words. There is an original church that Jesus built. In the Indian language, we call it the Pukka Church. There is a strong and true church that belongs to Jesus Christ. And it predates any other church. Just go back to the scriptures and see it. And you sit down and you ask someone the same question that was asked to me one, one time by my neighbor when I was yet not a, a, a member of the Lord's church. He asked me this. He said the same question. Matthew, if you put someone on an island for a year and gave them only the New Testament, when they come off that island, what church would they want to join? Would they want to go join a church? I don't know. If so, what church, what church would they want to go join, Matthew? I don't know. He said, well, you remember the Methodist church. Could you give someone just the Bible and them come off that island after a year? They've never heard anything from anyone. They just read their Bible for a year, studied the New Testament for a year. Could they possibly say, I want to go to the Methodist church with Matthew? It's not in there. 
that well was dug some 1,500 years later. There are other wells that were dug maybe 600 years after the time of Christ. Maybe 1,700 years after the time of Christ. In our city, just drive down the road. People are digging more wells today. Here's my spiritual well. Come to the, to the Hope Church. Come to the Believing Church. Come to the, I, I, it's, we're not in line with any denomination, but our pastor, he started this church, and you come to this church. We've got our own creed book. We've got our own tradition. We've got our own way of doing things. Come and hear them. Let me tell you something, my friend. Jesus says to this woman, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. Men who have dug wells since Jesus gave that water have dug in vain. If I'm going to that well, I go to that well in vain. Because my Lord told me before any of those wells were ever dug, He told me that He provided the water I need. And that if I'll take it, I'll never thirst again. That's hard, that's hard for us sometimes to see in America, but I'm telling you, come with me to Northeast India and talk to the people who drink from those wells. It's the saddest thing you've ever heard. You sit down and study with their pastors. They know no Bible. You ask them, well, why, how do you do what you do on Sundays? They say, well, we have these council meetings that we have to go to in the city once a month. They tell us what to do. We come back and we do it. You don't know any, why do we don't know any scripture? They're drinking out of a false well. No one, not any physical well, not any spiritual well dug by men, no one compares to Jesus, and that which he gave was sufficient. But hear what he says. I shall, the, he says, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now let's, let's stop here a moment. Let's drive a stake here because we need to hear this and we need to understand this as Christians. If, we know I've, if I know I've gone to the right source, if I know that the well I've gone to is Jesus Christ, and I know that going to the well of Jesus Christ has allowed me to be only what he would have me to be, and I know that by going to the well of Jesus Christ that at my at my salvation, I was added to the church of Jesus Christ because I found that out in his word in Acts 2.42. And I know that's the case. Then it ought to be true of me what he says about these people that have done this. Verse 14, I ought to be able to experience that, to see that in my life. Why do some of our young people doubt their faith? Why do some of our middle-aged people doubt their faith? Why, do some of our, why are some of us weak? Why are some of us doubting? Why are some of us have a difficult time? Why is it that you can look at another person and they seem so strong in their faith? And they seem so confident in their faith? And they seem to be having a joyous time? A lot of it comes down to what is said right here by Jesus. And is it true of me? If I've drunk in the water that he's provided, if I'm fully satisfied in my soul by what Jesus provides for me, Jesus says, it will become in me a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. I'm going to suggest something to you. Get a notebook. It's a pocket-sized notebook. Small, this one's a little too big. Small, something that'll easily fit into your pocket. And a pen. And carry it with you all the time. And here's why. In the school of preaching, we focus on memorizing scriptures. That's a good thing to do. It's good to know scriptures by heart. When I'm over uh, teaching in, in India, they do the same thing. They memorize scriptures. But on, the, on our, one of our rides, I was talking to that school principal, and I asked him, I said, you know, is it good that we give these students memory work? And it, the thought occurred to me because that day my class had quoted some verses about evangelism. <laughs> and I got out of class and I walked downstairs, and there was Lalit 
who is the dean of, of, of the boys' school, not the principal, he's the dean, he's like in charge of their, their discipline, and he had his little bag that he always has, and he's always kind of got this far away look in his eyes, like he's thinking of something else. And he'll see you, oh, hi, hi. And where is he going? I know where he's going. He's going the same place he's always going when I see Lalit. He's headed out into the community. School is over. He's got his bag. I know what's in his bag. Bibles and Bible tracks. I know where he's going. He's going to preach. He's going to teach. He's probably going to the bank. He's probably going to the store. But that's not what he's going to be doing. He's not just going to the bank. Everyone else, they're all standing in line like this. Not Lalit. Lalit is in line preaching, teaching. Everyone else is walking through the marketplace. How much is this? How much is that? Not Lalit. Lalit Lalit is, hey, give me two of those. By the way, let me tell you about Jesus. He was living the scripture. Here's my challenge to you. Take that notebook, keep it in your pocket, and make it the goal in your life. If you want to memorize some scriptures every day, wonderful. But make it your goal to live certain scriptures every day. And when in your day you have it come to your mind, a certain scripture, and perhaps, perhaps that scripture came to your mind and it helped keep you from committing a sin. Or perhaps that scripture came to your mind and you did something that, that, that was positive, that was good for the sake of the Lord. Or perhaps that scripture came to your mind and you told someone about Jesus. Whatever it is, you take that, when that is over, when that's done, you take out that notebook and you open it up and you write down very briefly what you did, what happened. I avoided that sin. I told this person that. I gave this to somebody. And you write that scripture. And you may not know the scripture by heart, but you know those key words. You know those words that popped into your head. I was talking to a friend about this. He said, man, this scripture comes to my head. Now, I can't quote the scripture, but I know the middle part of it. Write that down. And then if you've got a family, guess what family devotion time is at night? Take out your notebooks. We're going to talk about the scriptures we live today. Well, I did this, but, uh, and this happened to me, but I don't, remember, I don't know where that scripture is or what the exact script. Well, let's look it up together. All right, fill out the scripture. Fill out the reference. Okay, good. That's my challenge to you. Does that, is that what m- this means, that you've got to have a notebook saying what you've done, or you've got a notebook that tells you what, how the scripture? No, but by journaling it, if you don't clearly see it in your life, you don't see this water of life pouring out of you in your life, this will help show it to you, or it'll help show the absence of it to you. It's just a method to help me see, is this true of me? Am I living this way? And as a way of warning in that, if you find that, no, no, when I go out and come back and I open this up, it's just a desert in there. Jesus gives you the answer. You're allowing yourself to thirst. You're not, you're not going to the source. Get in there and drink in the word of God. Constantly, regularly. Jesus said it's going to be a fountain of water springing up. from In this life, yes, but in the life to come as well, into everlasting life. Finally, the woman asks her third question. It follows an event that changes her perspective of the conversation. So far, she's been thinking very carnally. But when she makes a statement in verse 15, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw, she is expecting a carnal blessing because she's still misunderstanding the teaching. And Jesus gives an answer that seems very strange in verse 16. He says, go call your husband and come here. That seems like an odd answer for the flow of this conversation. But there's a point to it. Watch what he does for this woman. The woman answers. Now watch, she's going to be honest. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Now watch what Jesus does for her. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. Is she a sinful Samaritan woman? Yes, she is. But she's been honest with her Lord. And he showed forth a miracle to her. I know your life. I know things you've never told me. Watch what the response in her is. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And suddenly she turns herself towards spiritual things. 
She says what? Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you Jews say that Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Now that's a statement, but it implies a question. Who's right, the Jews or the Samaritans? You're a prophet. You're an authority. You tell me who's right. The, the point that she misses and that we cannot miss is that the water makes us one. Get over this physical division. It's not about Jew and Samaritan. It's not about this mountain and that mountain. The water, when you drink the water that I give, it makes you one. That is the message Jesus is giving her. Listen to the answer he gives beginning in verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither uh, on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. That's what we're doing this morning. A group of people have gathered together who have drunk from that one source, Jesus Christ. That one true source, living water. And, and, and our prayer be to God that we've drunk it in and we've continued in it and that it's, it's pouring forth out of us. And you've got how many wells, how many springs of water gathered in one place? Spiritual fountains all gathered together in one place to worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And hear what Jesus says. It closes out his conversation with the woman. It closes out our sermon this morning. This simple truth. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I am that Christ. What a revelation. Everything she's been hearing, this woman unknowingly is speaking with the Savior of the world. And here at the end, he reveals it to her. You'll find as you continue to read that she leaves her water pot sitting there at the well and runs back to the city to give that good news. And But that's for next hour. What we want to make sure of this hour is that when we hear that final sentence of Jesus, I who speak to you am he, we need to understand that this morning we've been hearing the words of Jesus. There's been no particular church doctrine taught this morning. There's been no synod or, or council that put together the message that came to you. We opened up the words of Jesus Christ and we heard what Jesus had to say to a woman who was out by a well. And I tell you that the message and the statement that Jesus made to her at the end of the conversation is the same message that Jesus has for you and me at the end of this sermon. And it is a simple one, but it is a profound one. And it is, I am the Christ. But there's so much said in that statement. Jesus is the Savior of the world. The question is not, can He save? The question is not, are you categorically exempt from that salvation? The question is not, is there some other source you can go to? No, you can't. That's not the question. The answers are simple. You are not exempt no matter who you are in this building today. There is no other source for that salvation. Any other well that someone else dug won't bring it. Those aren't the questions we need to ask. The question is not about location and should I be here, should I be there? Uh, can we make some sort of physical division of this? No, no, no. The question is not are there sides that we can take, divisions that we can make. No, the question is not that. Jesus makes it simple. What is the question that each of us must answer this morning? And it is this. Have I gone to that source? Have I taken in that living water? Are you in Christ this morning? If you're not, there's no hope. 
If you're not, there's no living water inside of you. But the good news is that you can come to Christ. You can drink of that water whereby you will never thirst again. And it's interesting to me that Jesus here gives it as a picture. He, he, he gives us the metaphor of water. But there's another metaphor of water that stands between me and drinking in that water, and that is the metaphor of water, which is a burial. Do you want to be one of those who is a spring of water? Then meet Jesus in the water of baptism. Romans chapter 6 tells us that that water is a picture of his tomb. And that if you'll be buried with him in baptism, Romans 6, 3 and 4, that, that just as you can be buried into his death, you will rise to walk in newness of life. What kind of life? A life where you're a new creature? Romans chapter 6 goes on to tell us that the old man of sin is put to death. But you're a new creature. What kind of creature? A creature filled with this water that springs forth unto everlasting life. Have you ever done that? If not, why not? All that woman had to do was drop her, her vessel down into the well and pull up and give Jesus a drink. Simple. All you have to do is obey. Simple. But will you? And Christian, Christian who you have not, you have not been drinking in that water recently. It is not springing forth out of you. Go back to the source. Come home to that source that loves you and that will fill you with living water and that will cause it to spring forth from you in this life all the way into the next. Now is the time to respond as we stand and as we sing. Oh, Jesus.